sex for favors, secrets, cover-ups, corruption. I've heard things that'll blow your mind. Who cut the power off? Wait, what do you mean we've been cancelled? I'll have you know I was the governor of Minnesota. We're being replaced by who? Oh, look at me. I'm Jesse Ventura. My show got cancelled. <laughs> we all know whose government you're working for, Jesse. It's time the real truth came out. By the power of water filters, I will destroy corruption. No more sex for secrets. No more cover-ups. It's time for Gamergate. Welcome to Bizarro Land. It's the sort of place where electronics arts employees make reasonable statements. Where Bobby Kotick is once again proven to have keen business intuition when it comes to certain individuals and their ability to manage projects and handle money. It's the sort of Twilight Zone-esque reality where site owners who've had positions in the past have seemingly swapped them a la some digital version of Freaky Friday. Why, even Hot Pockets has responded, saying that the janitorial staff from 4chan is doing an excellent job. In fact, they deserve a reward, and what better reward than the hot, creamy goodness of a nuked Hot Pocket burning and scolding your throat as it explodes in your stomach. It has been a wild ride. It's been a month now since the last video I put up talking about Gamergate and the issues that were popping up, and by God, a lot of shit has happened since then, and I want to try to condense it down and give you a, a sort of chronological retelling of some of the key events that have played out over the last four weeks. To do that, I'm going to have to breeze through some of these, but I'll provide plenty of links in the description. So if you want to go and check this out yourself, the links will be listed to different articles and screen caps, so you can go check it out and see what you think. So with that out of the way, let's jump back to September 1st and see what's happened over the last month. Well, the first week of September was just chock full of interesting events. In fact, news came from PAX about Zoe Quinn's panel. Literally tens of people showed up for it. As you can see from this non-packed picture of all those not existing people sitting in those empty chairs. In fact, I heard one of the staff members at this event had told people to be careful with their pocket change in case they accidentally drop something and the reverberations of it created an echo so loud it was like a, a sound cone that would deafen people walking by the building. Luckily for Quinn, of course, Dashcon members happened to be in attendance, and they had the solution that she needed. And it didn't even cost her $17,000. What a lucky day for Zoe Quinn. Now, right on the heels of that, we had two articles drop. One pro-Gamergate, one anti-Gamergate. And we're going to look at the anti one first. That was from Jen Frank for The Guardian. Now, Jen ran into a little bit of trouble. You know, apparently when you write an article and you have financial ties to the people you're talking about, that's kind of an issue in real journalism, and Jen apparently walked away from being a journalist for a little while in relation to this, because there was money coming from Quinn to her, and from her going to Maya Kramer, who had a relationship with Zoe Quinn as well. It did not look too good for Jen Frank, and people were a little pissed off, to put it lightly. Image macros were circulating, people were talking to The Guardian. Now, Frank had released a statement essentially saying that she had wanted to put a disclaimer in there, but The Guardian told her, no, don't do that. A little incredulous about that, but doesn't really matter because we had a new challenger approach. Milo Papadopoulos, famous television actor from Webster, and also body double for Phoenix Wright. Now, he began to tweet out at the very beginning of September that he was going to start to cover Gamergate. He was going to look into some things. And his first article really caught people's attention because he wasn't tepid or timid in how he handled the subject. In fact, he wasn't afraid of these corrupt journalists or their little buddies in the indie game development scene. His article, Feminist Bullies Tearing the Video Game Industry Apart, was well received. It got a lot of buzz online because it was the first real article to take the other position, to actually look into it. Now, Milo doesn't have any investment in the gaming industry. He's not a gamer. In fact, he had to learn how to play video games. He did a couple of live streams about them just to get an idea of what the experience was like and what the gaming demographic was like. In fact, it would seem the very first week of September had a lot to do with news articles being released in news websites. Take the gaming website TechRaptor, for instance. Not only did their site host pull their support from them, sending them to talk about it publicly, saying, hey, you know, we've got an issue to deal with. We're, we're going to have to look for a new server. You can see this in the screen cap. This is the conversation that was taking place about this. But it would seem that after that got resolved, they were shadow banned from Reddit. And on top of it, they had their website attacked in some manner that took them a few days to even be able to address it and fix the issue. Now, as a side note, I'm going to put a link to their website in the description because they were one of the very first websites to really even try to talk about this. They're a smaller website 
and they, they tried to go to bat for gamers. They tried to talk about the issue because everybody else was being quiet about it. Nobody wanted to cover the issue. And as a response, they got harassed. They had their site taken down. They got banned from websites where they could promote or talk about their work. And that's unfair. It's unfair to the little guy trying to make a name for themselves in the industry. So if you're interested in gaming news, check it out. Give them, give them a look. I'll also have Games Nosh down there as well because they were another site that really tried to at least talk about it. Both those sites really stick out in my mind from the very beginning of all these things that have happened until this point today. Of course, not wanting to look like less of a prick than their gaming journalist peers, GamerRanks decided to fire a few shots off at the fine young capitalists saying that they don't have an excuse to be safe from scrutiny. And their hit piece, GamerRanks went after them and picked apart at what the fine young capitalists were about, and they were very brave too by closing the comment section down so they didn't have to hear any feedback. Now, that doesn't surprise me, considering this is a website associated with Ian Miles Chong, former white supremacist. In fact, he might be the only Asian white supremacist I've ever heard of. That is, that is one hell of an accomplishment, Ian. You can see from this screen cap that floated around shortly after this, that Ayn has one hell of a history and some very unique viewpoints. Now he's gone onto Twitter afterwards to say he's a changed individual. Now instead of being a white supremacist, he's just an asshole in general using social justice to beat up on people he doesn't like. Seems like a, a brand new leaf. He's really, he's really turned it around. Uh, give him a golf clap if you can. Now for those of you not familiar with who Ayn Miles Chong is, he is a self-described turbo feminist. He was also working at the site and defending it during the KSI incident where he had gone up to people at a convention and motorboated a few chicks. Ian had gone to Twitter to say how terrible this was and had articles on GamerRank saying how horrible this was until the very woman that was motorboated by KSI in that video went on Twitter herself and told Miles he needs to get fucking laid and stop putting his nose in other people's business. Apparently that advice did not stick. And closing out that first week of September, we had a bit of a bombshell drop, especially in relation to what was going on at Reddit. Uh, if you recall, a lot of people were getting uh, comments deleted, especially in that Total Biscuit thread that had upwards of, I think, 25 to 30,000 comments, and tens of thousands of those comments were deleted. Threads were being taken down at a uh, majority of subreddits. People were getting shadow banned, and even more recently, you know, we were just talking about uh, TechRaptor having their account shadow banned. Well, this was a leaked interview between a moderator or former moderator at Reddit that helped to highlight some of the issues that are going on with the administration of the website. And it covered a lot of things, talking about hidden code, bannable word lists, uh, allowing certain people to be doxxed because the administration didn't like them, people being threatened with being labeled a pedophile for trying to provide security for users on the website, as well as their attitude about shadow banning and deleting topics. Now, that audio interview is up on SoundCloud. I'll have a link down in the description if you want to go listen to it. It's about 40 or 50 minutes long, but it, it really gives some insight into what the hell's going on over there. If you've been shadow banned, if you've felt some weird things are going on behind the scenes, it really helps to explain exactly why you're not crazy and probably what you're thinking is happening is actually happening. Now, not to be outdone by week one, week two was right out of the gates. It started off with its own bang. That was a Lord Cat stream on Twitch TV in which he was talking to some people about an upcoming video that was going to be released. That video, Indie Feasible, was put up by Camera Lady and Short Fat Otaku. That was the channel on YouTube that it appeared on. In the video, there were quite a few allegations about IndieCade and the Independent Games Festival and talking about the relationships these people had and information that had come to light after the Polytron hack that took place about two or three weeks prior. Now, the video was taken down, and there's been some debate as to the exact reason why. There, are some, there seems to be some sort of legal issue about the information that's in the video itself. I don't really know. I haven't had a chance to talk to either of the individuals that put the video up. I know they've made some statements, and I know that they were talking about re-editing it and having a lawyer vet it so it was good to go. But I do know that they are releasing a third video that's coming up in the next couple of days, and it's going to focus on Silver String Media. So hopefully they can get those re-edited videos up, and they can get that new one out. Now, if you're curious about some of the information they talked about in the first couple of videos, you can go check out this Games Nosh article, I'll have a link in the description as well, that goes over some of the information they talked about. Again, it's not the video itself, but it does touch on what they were talking about. Now, up until this point, we had seen a couple of things. We'd seen Kotaku and we'd seen Polygon make some statements in regards to allegations that had come out. Uh, Kotaku released statements about Nathan Grayson and his relationship with Zoe Quinn. Stephen Totello had gone on record saying that they were going to adjust Kotaku's 
guidelines in reference to Patreon and being able to donate to people in the industry on a monthly basis. Uh, Polygon as well did a article talking about uh, their stance on Patreon, but they didn't take the same route that Kotaku did. Instead, deciding that, hey, there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, we don't see an issue. Uh, it's not it's not a uh, ethical concern. Well, we finally got a real response, the first website to really step up to the plate. Now, the escapists had allowed conversation about this up until this point in their discussion forum, but there hadn't been an official policy or response. Uh, many people were still upset about the Zoe Quinn story from months and months and months ago that had blamed uh, her harassment on a website called Wizard Chant. Well, there was a publisher's note put up, and it addressed quite a lot of things. In that publisher's note, and it's five pages long, again, the link will be in the description, they go over a few things, but one of the main things, and I think the most important thing, is they apologize. They apologize for not trying to get the other side of the story. They also set out a new set of standards, what their policy is in regards to authors recusing themselves from covering certain subjects, about Patreon and financial donation, and a whole host of other things. But The Escapist was really the first one to do this. Even though Kotaku and Polygon had addressed some concerns, they didn't come forward and actually try to talk to their community about it. Also this week, we had Milo releasing another article talking to game journalists directly and telling them that he thought they were reacting poorly to the concerns of gamers and those that felt that there were issues going on in the industry. Another piece of news that came out during this time, uh, because people were starting to talk about corruption on all levels in the journalism industry and in gaming itself, was this post that showed up on subreddit Kotaku in Action. This was posted by somebody who said he worked in the Australian gaming journalism business. Now, he had a lot of things to say, but one of the more interesting things that he had put up was that there had been a hack of forums that uh, 40,000 accounts had been put in danger and that EA had not responded and the gaming press had not responded because they had relationships with each other. Well, two days later, Cinema Blend put up an article. And in fact, EA admits 40,000 users were hacked after a whistleblower steps forward. Let that sink in for a moment. Here you have somebody posting and saying, hey, because of the relationship between this video game company and journalists, this was a story that was not reported on. 40,000 people, their passwords, their usernames, potentially their emails, and personal identifying information were put at risk. But this story was not going to be covered because of close relationships between the gaming press and the industry they cover. And this isn't just smoke being blown up your ass. Somebody actually looked into this. And sure enough, it turns out that actually fucking happened. This is another clear-cut example of the problem when you have too close a relationship with the industry you're covering. The first of which would have been the fine young capitalists not being able to get anybody to cover their story. And of course, up until this point, right now, we're in the middle of the second week of September, that's still happening. Here's Jason Schreier of Kotaku saying, hey, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to cover the fine young capitalist story. It's too messy for me. And I don't think it's, uh, you know, interesting enough, or I don't think there's enough... Uh, valid points. I don't know what exactly his deflection was. You can read it here. It's in a, a post that he had put up. Not that it really mattered, though, because the Fine Young Capitalist, on September 11th, hit their fundraising goal. In fact, they didn't just hit it, they surpassed it. So all the people that had donated had succeeded in helping them reach that goal and push that game development process further ahead. Now, you may be wondering, with all these things that are happening, you've got Reddit mods coming forward and saying that people are trying to hush up uh, conversation about this. You have evidence that moderators are talking to Zoe Quinn and suppressing conversation. People are coming forward from fucking Australia saying EA accounts have been put in danger but nobody will cover it because the journalists are friends with the people at EA. You've got the escapists coming forward and saying, hey, we fucked up, we're going to address it, and we're going to reform our policies. You have the fine young capitalists hitting their fundraising goal. And yet, still, at this point, no other sites are talking about any of this. The Gamers Are Dead articles had come out, and that was really it. So you would think it would be weird that Jason Schreier would say, there's not a story here. Well, you're going to find out exactly why nobody was covering any of these things. You'll find out why Jason Schreier didn't think this was of interest. Because in week three, a fucking nuclear bomb is dropped on the heads of these shitty corrupt game journalists that help to highlight exactly what the fuck is going on. Now, I want to preface week three before we get into it, because there, there are a couple of things. I'm trying to give you a short and dirty uh, chronology to what's going on. But a lot of things happen, and the timeline in which they happen is kind of important. It's going to be important later on, specifically when I'm talking about 4chan and Moot, when I'm talking about uh, XOXO Fest, when I'm talking about all these things. So I'm going to try to lay it out as it happened, but I want you to pay attention to the dates that these happen on. Now, at the start of week three, we got introduced to the Kool-Aid drinking crazies 
of XOXO Fest. In fact, people started doing image edits of pictures that were coming from this particular convention. The one you're looking at right now is a pretty good descriptor of the vibe you get when you're looking at XOXO. You see a lot of the same type of person, 20 to 30 year old, white suburbanite, educated, entrepreneurial, hipster fucks would be the best way really to describe that crowd. And then mix in a little bit of venture capitalism, and that's pretty much pretty much what you have. But a lot of the people who attended this have been related either directly or tangentially to Gamergate itself. You had people like Leigh Alexander from Gama Sutra who was there. Anita Sarkeesian was there. And as we'll find out in just a little bit, Moot, or Christopher Poole from 4chan, was also there. Now, on the 16th, based mom, Christina Summers, released a video, a factual feminist video, asking, are video games sexist? And she looked at the issue and she came to the conclusion that, no, gamers are not a demographic of horribly racist, sexist people that are out to hurt others. They're just devoted to their hobby. They like video games. And at the end of the day, that's what they want, just good video games. People liked the video. They responded quite well to it. Of course, the game journalists didn't. We got a lot of articles after that video came out attacking Christina Summers. They were up on Polygon and other websites, and they tried every avenue of attack. She's a conservative. She's not an actual feminist. She's suffering from internalized misogyny. Anything but addressing the points the video raised. Now, beginning around the release of this video, and up until about the 19th, so in the span of three days, people started to notice something happening on 4chan, specifically on the V-board and even later on on Poll. They noticed mods were doing it for free much more than they usually did. The frequency of them fucking with users was increasing exponentially every day. Now, we would find out exactly why that was in just a little bit. But first, that bombshell. Now, Milo had hinted that something big was coming out. He had said, you guys aren't going to fucking believe this. All those talks that you've had, all the speculation about there being some kind of a coordinated attack, especially when you consider that the Gamers Are Dead article seemed to be a coordinated attack. You had 12 to 14 articles in a 24-hour period of time with the exact same spin, the exact same narrative, all yelling at gamers who were upset that video game journalism might be corrupt. And to gamers, that looked like there was something going on, like there was a secret group coordinating what was happening. Well, the bombshell hit. There was a secret group, Game Journos Pro. Now, the list had been established about four years previously by Kyle Orland of Ars Technica. And among the members, you will find prominent figures from nearly every video game journalism website. People like Jason Schreier, you remember Jason, who just a week before the article had come out had said, I don't want to cover the fine young capitalist. There's no reason to do it. I don't see a story here. Well, now we know why he didn't want to cover it. He is a member of Game Journals Pro. And what did they talk about on Game Journals Pro? Well, this very first article had touched on one of the threads and one of those email chains. And one of those email chains was about Zoe Quinn. How they were going to handle the story, how they were going to handle the fallout of it. And you can notice, and I, I highly encourage you to go read the article that Milo put out because he has snippets up of exactly what they said and in fact later on he'll release even more information about this particular group but you will see they keep each other in line people like Ben Kuchera would yell at others and tell them that he was going to stop talking to him at that exact moment because he wanted to remain civil. Greg Tito of The Escapist was on this particular group and he had said we have a conversation going on at The Escapist I don't necessarily agree with what's being said but I don't see a problem with it and he was bombarded for daring to allow open conversation. Ryan Smith had mentioned, why is it that we cover one sort of topic, but we won't cover the other? Why will people run pieces like Max Temkin? But when it comes to Zoe Quinn, which is pretty much the exact same kind of issue, we will not cover it. And he was bombarded with hate for even asking that question. People in this specific group knew Zoe Quinn. They had a personal relationship with her. One particular individual talked about having conversations about his relationship with her and specifically mentioning the feel better gift that was proposed in this group itself. If you remember the developer letter that was circulating around that was signed by people in different video game companies uh, saying that they wanted peace and you know give peace a chance and everybody should love one another and hold hands, you will see the predecessor of that discussed by games journalists weeks before that letter ever materialized. They wanted to do the exact same thing but with game journalists. And the idea was shot down because it would look too suspicious. So how fucking convenient then 
that after that was proposed in this secret group of game journalists who were stifling conversation about Zoe Quinn and about gaming journalism corruption. How, you know, how convenient is it that their proposal is put a halt to and then all of a sudden game developers decide to do it? It's almost like it's almost like they used their connections and personal relationships to get game developers to do it instead. Remember, in week two, we had the story about somebody saying games journalists wouldn't cover a story about a forum being hacked because they were friends with people at a video game company with the developers. So it's clear that there is an incestuous relationship going on here, that there's collusion taking place here. This was a damning article. Now, they tried to deflect and they tried to act like this wasn't a big deal. However, reading through the conversations, you can see that it's complete bullshit from their part. Now, going back to our timeline, as I said, the week started and we had all these weird pictures coming out of XOXO Fest. And then we had Summers release her factual feminist video. And then came the bombshell, as I said, Milo released the Game Journals Pro article, his first article about it. Well, during those, you know, those couple of days, people had noticed the heavy moderation taking place on 4chan, and they wanted a direct answer. They tried asking mods, and mods had told them to go fuck themselves. Well, finally, Moot steps in. And of course, he comes to save the day, right? This is, this is Moodles. This is Christopher Poole. This is Mr. Free Speech. Well, you would be dead wrong. He posts this. Gamergate discussions will no longer be allowed, and pretty much go fuck yourself. If you read that last line, I know the screen cap might be a little blurry, I apologize for it, but he essentially takes a parting jab at people interested in Gamergate and tries to tell them to fuck off and that they're no different really than Guy Fox wearing Guy Fox mask wearing idiots. That that is a level of respect he has for Gamergate, and the fact he's using anonymous as an insult means he doesn't give a shit about them either. Now I'm not gonna go too much into depth right now. Like I said, I just want to give you a basic timeline. But be aware at this convention Moot was at, along with people like Leigh Alexander and Anita Sarkeesian, were venture capitalists. Venture capitalists who he had previous relationships with, who funded projects he worked on. And we would also come to find out, and again this will be covered more in depth later on, that he had relationships with people working directly at Gawker. Gawker is the parent company of Kotaku. Now, it's around this exact same time that the Greg Lisby interview is starting to circulate a little bit more. Now, this was somebody who was interviewed. Uh, he wasn't specifically briefed on every aspect of Gamergate. He was just asked certain questions in regards to journalism ethics. He is somebody who taught law and journalism ethics. So he would be somebody you would want to talk to about. Now, the raw, unedited interview is up on YouTube. Again, the link will be in the description. You can go watch it yourself. But some of the key points he touches on, and what I find to be really damning when you look at the game journalist, is he's asked, what about people being financially connected to the industry they cover? Absolutely not, he says. That is an ethical problem. What about people having romantic relationships or landlord and tenant relationships with people in an industry they cover? Absolutely not. That is an ethical problem. He even goes so far as to state that though you may develop friendships or you may have a cordial relationship with people in an industry that you cover, it is an extremely tenuous line that you're walking and that a good journalist should always be hyper vigilant in regards to something like that. And as this Game Journals Pro article that Milo had put out shows, games journalists are anything but vigilant. They are lazy, ego-centered assholes. Now, I don't want to make this sound like I'm applying this as a blanket statement to every games journalist. Now we've seen a lot of them step up and say either I have problems with this and you'll see that in the leaked emails that's up on the Breitbart article. Some people in that uh, email chain said hey you know what this is wrong I don't want any part of it. There is a wall that should be put up between uh, myself and a subject and this is a breach of professional ethics. Other people would come out later and say I didn't like it or I wanted no part of it. People directly questioned it. So there are good games journalists, but there seems to be an atmosphere or an attitude in this particular industry where those people are suppressed and not really allowed to talk about it. I mean, my God, look how they treat each other in private. It's no wonder the majority of them don't want to say anything in public. They're going to get shit on in such a way that their careers will be over. Now, if you thought week three was already over with, you'd better hold on to your asses because when you look at the entire month of September in review, from the period of the 14th to the 21st was a massive amount of activity. From articles being posted to public stances being taken from different individuals inside and outside of the industry. Take this Niche Gamer article from an Xbox dev. One of the people who worked on the Xbox design team weighed in on Gamergate. Again, it's a fantastic article and it gives you an inside perspective on how they view these issues. But of course, Milo wasn't done either. After releasing that first Game Journals Pro article, he had one more to pop out. And this one has to be read to be believed. 
The emails that prove video games journalism must be reformed, and even looking at that title quote, who here hasn't slept with a PR person or game developer, am I right, helps to highlight one of the issues with games journalism. It is a two-faced nature of them telling their audience that they're misogynist and racist and sexist and horrible, yet behind closed doors they will make jokes about sex and jokes about unethical behavior and there's no, there's no consequence to it whatsoever. It's fine for them to do it, but not okay for us to do it. They're going to chide us and profiteer off telling the core audience that they're flawed and that there's something wrong with them. And that little voice most people have in the back of their head telling them not to be insufferable pricks 24 hours a day seems to be missing from a lot of these people. Just take a look at the deluge of articles I had mentioned against Summers for her video. Now one interesting thing about the social justice warrior mentality found in a lot of these gaming journalists who are at the core of the problem we're dealing with is they can dish it, but they can't take it. This quote is from the Polygon article about Summers' video. Summers is also fond of insults. She tweeted that I am a mansplainer and invited me to address what she describes as her ideas. Others added that because I question the views of one woman, I must be a misogynist. One person compared me to Napoleon, the pig, not the emperor. I am not the first person to face the wrath of video game sexism deniers. Well, I think the person who wrote this article needs to listen and believe, you mansplaining misogynist. It is yet just another example of how they can fling shit, but they cannot handle it being flung back at them. If you read the email chains that they have between themselves, you'll see how they laud the idea of closing down and heavily regulating comments. They cannot stand when people give them criticism. They cannot stand having to answer for their actions or their statements. It's also by this point in September that we start to see that the people who have been writing and mass emailing advertisers are finally having an effect. Now there were few that already had come out and said we're going to pull advertising from these different game journalism sites or we're not going to associate with them because it's bad PR. But then we see something like this from Rock Paper Shotgun. Essentially begging for money. Rock Paper Shotgun is now running the equivalent of a Patreon account asking you to directly pay them money for merely existing and writing terrible articles. And yet, still there's even more in this third week. The admin of Funny Junk takes a moment to shit on Moot's head and laugh at the fact that he can't handle people talking about something that personally might offend him. In fact, the admin of Funny Junk invites people to come and mock him. And this is just a reminder that Funny Junk is one of the only places that has allowed free discussion about this. Up there with The Escapist and a few other image boards and websites, but Funny Junk has had that position from the very beginning. You can talk about whatever you want, put up the content you want to, and we're not going to interfere in any way. Now, most people have probably noticed by this point that NeoGAF had refused to really allow any discussion about this. People have been banned from the forums, conversations had been shut down repeatedly. Well, it starts to come out that maybe NeoGAF had a reason for that. This article that was put up on the Ralph Retort talks about NeoGAF and the site owner allegedly illegally selling content to Kotaku for a profit. Now they had done this action and then if you look back at the timeline of these events had changed their terms of service agreement to allow them to do it. But the fact of the matter is this article points out a timeline in which they had sold the information and then altered the uh, terms of service to make it allowable. Well bravo NeoGAF. And of course who could forget about Dina? God bless Mighty Number no. 9. You know, banning people that are financial backers to a project because they're talking about something unrelated to that project at different locations on the internet. And then saying, I don't like what you're saying, so I'm going to block you from the forums and from the official Comcept Twitter account. This is extra ridiculous when you take into account the fact that one of the backer rewards for donating to the project was forum access. So by banning people from the forums, you are rescinding their reward. Now, people began to ask for refunds. They wanted to do chargebacks, and they were told they couldn't. Well, that's a, that's a great job from a really good PR manager. Obviously, she got the job because she was the most qualified, not because she knew people at the company or was dating somebody who worked there. That would be insane. And if you're interested in reading more about how the Mighty Number no. 9 shitfest is now continuing into Gamergate, feel free to read the Ralph Retort because they have an article up about that as well. And this all, of course, brings us up to the current week, week four, or the very end of it. And this week has been slow compared to the third week, but then again, with the amount of activity that happened from the 14th to the 21st, it's understandable, especially when you look at it all put together. A lot of things have happened. 
Well, what happened this last week? Quite a few things, actually. You had the Investigamer come on to the Amazing Atheist channel to do a video about Gamergate. In fact, a lot of prominent atheists have spoken about this, and it's understandable because I think at the core of it, they see a similar thing happening right now. Now, I was able to do a live stream about two or three days ago with King of Pole, and he had somebody on named Koss, and Koss had mentioned something that we had joked about all the way back around the time of PAX, and that was the idea that they were going to introduce the term Gamer Plus. Now, atheists know what that means. They dealt with it with Atheism Plus, when social justice warriors come into a community and shit it up. Well, Koss actually said that he personally views the use of the term player as a more apt title. So essentially, instead of Gamer Plus, it would be Player. So perhaps those rumors back during PAX about Gamers Plus being introduced weren't so far off if they're if the other side is already looking at trying to change and find a new term. Well, it wasn't just the Amazing Atheist. You had people like Thunderfoot make quite a few videos. In fact, he suffered because of it. He put up videos criticizing Anita Sarkeesian onto his Twitter account. And because he dared to do that, his Twitter was put on a blockbot list, and it was taken off of Twitter itself. He had his account shut down. Now, you can look through his posting history. People have screen caps of the last handful of posts that he put up and nothing about them violates the terms of service. He was bullied off for daring to speak out, for daring to have another opinion. So you have people like the Amazing Atheist and Thunderfoot stepping in and talking about this. You have people like Justicar stepping in and talking about this. And these aren't necessarily positions of people who are gamers themselves, just bystanders who recognize something that's happening to the gaming community that they already went through. You have other signs that Gamers are sick of game journalism and they're sick of SJWs in their hobby. One good example of this would be the Steam Curator list. If you go to take a look, who's the top curator? It's not Kotaku, it's not Polygon, it's not Rock Paper Shotgun or PC Gamer or any of them. Who is it? Total Biscuit. A, a top spot for a top hat. And it's interesting too that he has the number one spot because if you go and read those Breitbart articles about the Game Journo Pro mailing list, you will quickly see that they dislike Total Biscuit. In fact, they should talk a lot of YouTubers. They do not like the idea of somebody else coming in and fulfilling the role that they have. Because if somebody else brings competition into the marketplace, they can't be corrupt assholes. They actually have to have standards then so they can compete. How fucking crazy is that? Now, maybe you're wondering exactly who's on that Game Journal's Pro list. I mean, after all, the previous couple of articles had talked about certain emails, but we never got a complete list. Well, Milo's got you covered because his most recent article actually lists every single one of them. So if you're curious who is working at what website and is a part of this, go check out the article because it will have their name listed and where they work. Now, some of you may be familiar with the Sarkeesian Effect documentary. That is still up on Patreon. Right now it's sitting at $6,600 a month. That is $6,600 of people's money that they're willing to put forward towards this project because they want to hear a different viewpoint. They're so sick, so absolutely tired of games journalists creating an atmosphere where people can't criticize or bring up other points of view. I mean, look what happened to Thunderfoot. He tried to use a social media service to air his opinions, and he was cut off at the fucking knees for it. So it's not a surprise that people would go and try to fund their own documentary to bring up an opposing viewpoint, because God knows where else are they going to go at this point. But every day this goes on, every single day it continues, it builds momentum, even during the slow days, even during the slow weeks. Hell, just take a look at the hashtags for Gamergate or Not Your Shield. This week, Gamergate surpassed a million tweets, and Not Your Shield is well over 100,000. Now, those numbers on their own are impressive, but when you consider the fact that multiple sites have refused to allow people to comment from NeoGAF to 4chan, TV tropes, and others, it is a remarkable thing that this has any momentum to it at all. But it shows the fact that gamers are sick of being talked down to. They are sick of corrupt people trying to act as if they don't have to have ethical standards. They are sick of people acting like the indie scene and games in general don't have issues to them. These past four weeks have highlighted that, and it has been one thing after another, momentum building upon momentum, bombshell after bombshell after bombshell. And when you sit back and you really take in the full picture, it is quite fucking remarkable.